Hello and welcome to our video on learning theories. We're going to be talking about some of the major learning theories in this video and there are many different versions of them and there are a lot of specific ones. So we're just going to kind of lump them together into three categories and get an overview. So if you're interested in writing about this or learning more, you definitely need to do more research, but I hope that this will serve as a nice introduction for you. All right, so first off, there are a lot of theories about learning and how learning takes place. So when a child learns something new from their parents or when a child goes to school and they learn something in class from a lesson, how does that actually happen? What are the conditions needed? What kind of behaviors are needed from the person facilitating that learning, the leader, the teacher, the parent, and what kinds of role does the child themselves play in that process? Each theory has their own view on all these different aspects of learning. So we're gonna talk about three today. The main ones that we're gonna cover are behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism. And some of these have a range of different names, so we've kind of lumped them all together and you'll see that. So here are some visuals that you can go back and review to look at um, that I found online that just have some basic uh, traits of each theory that you can kind of review to see what the differences between behaviorism, cognitivism, and social uh, theory or constructivism. There's, there's a range of different names, and so I'm trying to combine them so you'll see that, and I hope that that helps. Okay, the first one we're going to talk about is behaviorism. Some of the major theorists are Watson, Pavlov, Skinner, and Cantor, and these folks, many of them are those who focus on psychology or child development, although Cantor is very much focused on classroom uh, behaviors and, and discipline. So the learning theory suggests that learning happens through repetition and positive reinforcement, also known as operant conditioning. And so for these folks, they believe that learning happens based on a stimulus. When someone experiences some kind of stimulus from uh, their surroundings or another person, and then they react to it, that's conditioning. Then we have operant conditioning occurs when we are trying to facilitate that process to create new memories and behaviors. And so that behavior change is what they believe is actual learning. So for behaviorists, the learning didn't take place if the, if the behaviors don't change. Uh, that means they didn't really get it. And so the implications for teaching means then that the teacher's job is to model the correct behaviors and provide extrinsic motivation for engagement. Meaning that as I am teaching, I'm modeling the way I want you to behave, the way I want you to learn something, the way I want you to complete a task, and then I'm gonna show you how to do it. And as you do it and you try it out, I'm gonna reinforce the right behaviors and the right tasks and the right activities that I want to see for learning. And I'm going to provide consequences when I see um, infractions on that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be extreme, but if I see something negative taking place or you're doing it wrong, I'm gonna correct you, right? So that's the whole point of behaviorism. It is very much focused on the outcomes of how students behave based off of their learning situation. Implications for management means that I'm going to, in this model, set up clear boundaries, offer incentives, and often that means token economies. You'll see a lot of schools still function in a behaviorist model, even though it seems that um, many theorists and researchers nowadays view behaviorism as a little bit outdated, it still is very prevalent. So a lot of times the, the current research revolves around more progressive ideologies, Behaviorism is still prevalent in schools and you'll see tickets, um, token economies, which give prizes for good behavior or prizes for reading books, um, points, all that stuff is behaviorism. And so in this model, classroom management is based off of that kind of reward and consequence system. And um, we have to have those clear consequences set up. For language learning, the implications would mean that if I want to teach you new academic language or a second language, the way that will occur is through regular rehearsal, uh, correction if you get it wrong, and then also reinforcement when you get it right. It would be a lot of practice and rehearsal of that new language and that new vocabulary. Here are some visuals to help you out if you're trying to review behaviorism. And you can pause it and you can go back to it or you can uh, take a look at the presentation and download these images if you like. The next one is cognitivism or cognitive constructivism or also called information processing. So each of these has to do with the idea that learning takes place through a process. And so our major theorists would be Gestalt, 
Piaget, Vygotsky, Bloom, and Gagne. And again, most of these are people from the psychology world. And so as they look at how changes take place in the mind, um, they translate that into what does that look like in the classroom, particularly Vygotsky, who uh, came up with ZPD, which stands for Zone of Proximal Development. So that leads us to the implications for teaching. Teachers in this kind of a model would promote discovery and rely a lot upon intrinsic motivation. There's a lot of inquiry-based learning that happens with uh, cognitivism because we're very much concerned in this model about how the brain forms new knowledge. How does the mind retain information? How do you organize it in your mind? How do you take it in and keep it? And so those processes, they believe, require for teachers to set up a discovery kind of a model because that's gonna increase the engagement. It's gonna make it lasting memories instead of just rote memories that are probably gonna be lost uh, in a shorter period of time. There are cultural contexts considered in this model. So you wanna think about what matters most to students, what the, what the right uh, situation for learning would be for those individual groups of students. And you also, like I mentioned, wanna consider the zone of proximal development which means that if I assess my students and academically they are here, the tasks I give them should be a little above or a little below. And that's where I'm gonna get most of my growth and that's where I'm gonna achieve most learning to take place. So in this model, the teaching and learning is highly structured and well planned out. Um, but it doesn't mean that the teacher is always the sage on the stage. Uh, a lot of times in an inquiry-based model, the students have to lead a lot of what happens in the classroom. The implications for management then that is that you would create a learning environment that is goal oriented. If students have a goal and they believe that they have the right environment and the right support to achieve that goal, this perspective would argue that students will do that on their own. Um, therefore, it is highly focused on intrinsic motivation. Um, the, the folks in this, in this uh, perspective who ascribe to cognitivism would believe that all students have a natural inclination for curiosity and learning. And if we set up the right circumstances, they will engage in that, okay? And so that leads us to implications for language. And if we consider what we've heard so far about cognitivism or cognitive constructivism or information processing, whichever name you wanna use, uh, we would definitely be thinking a lot about scaffolding because we wanna make sure that we're not overwhelming students. We wanna create the right situation for their learning. We wanna consider their ZPD. We want to make it very learner focused so it has to be relevant to them and they would practice language in natural context there wouldn't be as much of the rote rehearsal kind of uh, reinforcement that would happen in behaviorism in this model there might be a lot more oral practice and a lot more natural situations for for studying that new vocabulary or that new second language there are some visuals for you to help you review these concepts. And again, there's a lot of different theories like information processing or Bloom's taxonomy. Um, all these things are related to cognitivism. Okay, so they are, not, uh, they are not the only thing in that field, but they are closely related and that's why I've grouped them together. So if you're interested in any one of those, definitely do some more research and look up some of those folks and their work. All right, last but not least, we have constructivism or social constructivism or also called social learning theory. Now you'll notice that the word constructivism was found in both of the last two theories and that's because it comes from a basic philosophical perspective that knowledge is constructed. Okay, so it's just how it's constructed um, that it differs. So the, the previous folks want to look at how memories occur, how people retain information, how they organize it. So, social constructivism would argue that all learning is based off of prior knowledge and social processes that occur um, in those person-to-person uh, -person contexts. So our major theorists here are Bandura, Bruner, Gardner, Erickson, Rogers, Maslow, Dreiker, and Dewey. Uh, in this mix, we've got a lot more people because more, some of them are a little more modern, um, but we have a mix of both psychology folks as well as educators. So you might have probably heard the name Dewey. He's one of our fathers of the United States um, American education system. He has uh, been a very influential philosopher in that regard. Dreiker is really um, influential as far as our classroom management uh, perspective of motivation and how psychological needs impact that. Um, and so you're, you're gonna see also that a lot of these things uh, stem from psychology as far as child development. Um, and also a psychological approach to, uh, to helping people change or helping people grow. Um, that humanist perspective comes from Rogers, 
Um, Erickson is a great one you've probably heard of in some of your child development courses. Um, so these are all people you can go back and look up if you're interested in this theory and want to know more about it. And they all have their own unique contributions. So if we look at their view on learning, uh, for these folks, all learning is based on connections to prior knowledge and it's social, like I mentioned. Therefore, the implications for teaching is that teachers are much more of a facilitator, very similar to the last theory. But in this case, um, the teacher would make adjustments throughout, monitor that process, and also be open to multiple outcomes. In social learning theory, we don't necessarily have to have one specific objective or outcome. Uh, we might have multiple outcomes and multiple different uh, behaviors or learning that takes place from different students and that's okay. Uh, we would consider multiple intelligences. You should be aware that there are many folks who actually criticize the idea of multiple intelligences. Um, that's Gardner's theory and uh, that doesn't mean that it is false or it's not true. What it means is I think uh, in general the criticism is that people took that theory and kind of went a little too extreme with it. Um, in other words, there are multiple intelligences, yes, but we shouldn't believe that everybody doesn't have all, okay? So we all have some different version of that. Um, and so some people went a little too far with it maybe, um, but just be aware of that criticism. If you're writing a paper on it, look that up. The implications for management under this theory would imply that a teacher considers the stages of development as well as motivation for behaviors. Um, that's where Dreiker comes in. Um, as well as some of um, Bender and Bruner. And, and that motivation has a lot to do with student behavior. And so if teachers are looking at how students behave in class and they feel like it's not what they want or it's not productive, then we have to, instead of training them to behave the way we want, we have to consider why they're behaving that way. Um, and that is a whole different approach to classroom management. Definitely has a lot to do with trusting relationships. So that comes from Rogers. We have to build that trusting relationship as the person who is facilitating the, the learning. You have to be the one who makes sure that students feel like they can trust you. If they don't feel like they can trust you or that they're safe, um, then they don't have some of those basic needs met. Um, as Maslow would argue, then they're not gonna get to a higher order of thinking or self-actualization. And so we have to consider all different aspects of the whole person in this model. Therefore, the implications for language would be that it has to be developed organically. It has to happen um, in those natural contexts of communication. Uh, doesn't mean we don't set up lessons, of course we do, but those lessons have to be really catered to the students and their needs, and everybody might be in a different place, and that's okay. Uh, we also would definitely consider greatly the first language to be very valuable, and we would look at the social cultural context of language at the same time. Thank you for your time. I hope this helped you out. Good luck with your work and have a great day.